And basalt, because it has a lot of iron and manganese, it's going to be black, green, dark brown. Okay, so that's igneous rocks. So let's say I say, um, well, let's say Gabbro. Let's pick one. What did I just tell you? How much information did I just convey to you? What would you know about that rock? It's, it's mafic, it's coarse grained. Is it intrusive or extrusive? Intrusive because it's coarse grained. Does it have a lot of iron and magnesium? Yeah, it's mafic, right? Dark color, you bet. Did it form at high temperature or low temperature? Top or bottom of Bowen's reaction series? Three quarters. <coughs> Top, yeah, kind of out there, so somewhere around 1,000 degrees centigrade. Look at all that information he had just out of that little trivial name. And just knowing that six, those six names plus peridotite and chromatotite off to the side, they're kind of unusual, you can pretty much sum up all the things you need to know about these rocks. <coughs> so it's really pretty simple. It's pretty systematic. And it's kind of a neat technique, isn't it? That trick of cross-plotting things. You can take two variables and figure it out. So that's kind of how we would approach looking at igneous rocks. So we know igneous rocks come from a melt. And there's a melt happening right in front of us there. So if we're going to look at melts now, we're going to look at either volcano, volcanoes forming extrusive volcanic rocks. So these are going to be fine-grained rocks for the most parts, right? So if I were looking at volcanoes, would I expect to find a granite there? Would I? Would there be a granite in a volcano? Extrusive. Is granite extrusive? No. no. Why isn't it an extrusive? Because it's coarse grained. It had to cool slowly. It's got to be an intrusive plutonic rock, doesn't it? So I wouldn't find granites with volcanoes. But I might find basalts or rhyolites, maybe some andesites. Okay, so right away I kind of kind of can cut the, the rock types I have to worry about in half knowing that with volcanoes I'm looking at extrusives. If I'm looking at what we call plutons or bodies that form to depth, it's just the opposite, isn't it? I'm going to be looking at granites, I'm going to be looking at diorites, I'm going to be looking at gabbros, because they've all got to be coarse grained, slow cooling rocks. So if I see a coarse grained igneous rock at the surface, did it form there? It couldn't, could it? It would have to be an extrusive rock, a fine-grained rock to have formed on the surface. So when I see a granite exposed at the surface, I know that there's been uplift and what we call exhumation, kind of digging up the body, you know? Only in this case, it's the rock body, and we're uncovering it, taking the surface material off of it, and now that rock layer that formed kilometers deep in the surface is now exposed at the surface. It's the only way I can get an, ex or get an intrusive rock, coarse grain, to be at the surface. It couldn't form at the surface. So that tells me a lot about what's going on in the area. So let's just look at the volcanic rocks. We talk about uh, active, dormant, and extinct volcanoes. You've probably all pretty much heard those terms. Kind of used on the news all the time. So what do they mean? How, how would I know if a volcano fit one of these categories? Well, active, well, if it's erupting, it's, it's active, right? Or if it's erupted any time in recorded history. If we have uh, some place where it's written down, it's active. For instance, Mount Vesuvius. It erupted in 79 AD. It's really the first time that we saw um, a Vulcan, uh, active volcano being described in the literature. It's an active volcano today. Last time it erupted was 1958. 
dormant says, eh, it's kind of sleeping. We don't really see anything written down. We see the cone still sitting there, but it's kind of weathered. It's not nice and fresh looking. And, you know, oftentimes we'll see these things, like these little cinder cones like this <coughs> over in Flagstaff, Arizona. And in the case of these little cinder cones, they tend to erupt, and then they get plugged off because they're erupting with rhyolite. And rhyolite's real gooey and thick. So when it plugs off the vent, it's plugged off. They usually don't erupt again. They're kind of short-lived little things, and boom, they're done. So, dormant. Extinct, it's, it hasn't erupted any time that we know of. And the cone is so weathered that usually it's just little bits and fragments sitting around. There's no obvious, really good cone. Sometimes what we see is what we call the volcanic neck. This is the lava that basically plugged off the volcano. And the cone used to extend all around the neck. That was the vent that was coming up, the pipe coming up through the cone, filled with magma. It chilled, shut off the volcano. And that still sticks up because that's harder than the cinder cone around it, so it doesn't erode as fast. So in a relative sense, we've eroded away all of the cone and more resistant uh, magma from the inside is still there. Is it possible for an extinct like old volcano to erupt again if, say, somehow? Well, you know, nothing's impossible, right? Generally, if it's in the extinct category, there is no evidence that anything's happened there for so long that we're just kind of saying the odds are pretty close to zero. But I wouldn't make them totally <coughs> zero. It erupted there once. Yeah, you never know. But it's probably some older system. Yeah. Um, I noticed in the photos on the left that the older volcano gets more trees and the around it. Is that the like, kind of like a way to tell how the volcano yeah, oh, it, it, yeah uh, well, possibly. First of all, it has to be an area where trees grow. So that may not always be the case. Okay. For instance, here in Shiprock, New Mexico, this is uh, a huge old volcano. Uh, we'll talk about it more later, but here's the volcanic neck that you see there. And you see some little necks sticking up here where they had some little offshoots from it. And no trees around there, simply because they don't grow there. So trees are kind of a little tricky. You have to be careful with those. Okay. So we've talked about these various types of igneous rocks, from mafic basalts to felsic rhyolites in the intermediate andesite. It just turns out that these basalts, andesites, and rhyolites act differently. They have different viscosity. So what's viscosity? Well, viscosity is simply the resistance of a fluid to flow. For instance, take a jar of molasses and take it out of the refrigerator, snap off the lid, you can turn the jar upside down, and just sit there, and the molasses doesn't move, does it? It's cold, and it doesn't do a thing. And finally, after a couple minutes of shaking and working on it, you might get some to kind of blurb out of the jar. That's high viscosity, high resistance to flow. But if I take that same jar of molasses, I put it in a pan of warm water on the stove, warm it up a little bit, I can pour that molasses out like it was water. That's low viscosity, low resistance to flow. Well, it just turns out that as I add iron and I add magnesium to the mix, it lowers the viscosity of the magma. Ah, so what has high iron and magnesium? The basalt, the mafic end, right? as I go to the felsic end with less magnesium, less iron, 
more silica, that's when the magma starts to get gooey and sticky and doesn't want to flow. So just by changing the chemical makeup from the top of Bowen's reaction series to the bottom of Bowen's reaction series, I can change the flowability, the viscosity of this magma. So I would expect to see things made out of a salt to be a real different shape than things made out of felsic, silica-rich material because the basalt's just going to run out all over the place like water, isn't it? So I'm not going to get a nice cone building up. This stuff is just going to run all over like this. This is basically basalt. You can just see how it's poured out of the base of this volcanic cone. Whereas on the other end, if I make it real silica rich, it's just going to be gooey like toothpaste. And it's going to take a lot of pressure to try and push it out of the vent. It's going to cool off fast because where does silica stuff fall on Bowen's reaction series? At the bottom. bottom, right? What's the temperature at the bottom of Bowen's reaction series? A lot colder than it is at the top, right? Top is about 1,200 degrees. Bottom is a really chilly 700 degrees centigrade. So already it's cooler, and just that drop in temperature, along with the extra silica, is going to make it even that more resistant to flow. So it gets gooier and stickier. So this cone here is, one would say, made out of silica-rich material, because the stuff just kind of spit out of the out of the vent little blobs, cooled right away, fell down, just piled up around the vent, didn't go anywhere. Ah. But in this case, there's a trick. Although most of these cinder cones do form that way, how did I get basalt flowing out here and silica making a cone back there? Eh, that's not going to happen. Volcanoes don't just magically change their composition. They can change composition, but there's got to be a reason. Here, it doesn't look like there's a reason. Actually, this cone stuff is basalt, just like the flow. Ah, what happened to the silica stuff? Huh? Well, it's this balance between temperature and silica content. What happened here? Well, there was a water aquifer that the volcano came up through. And when it went through that water-bearing aquifer, it cooled off the magma so much that it barely made it to the surface. It just kind of spit out, forming this cone. And there was a lot of steam as all that water from the aquifer was boiling away as that hot magma went up through there. And finally, most of the water was boiled away. and the hot magma kind of sealed the pipe around the edges, and then there was another eruption of the same basaltic material, but now there was no water to cool it down. And when it got up to the base of the cone, well, the cone's just kind of like gravel. It's just loose cindery bits. It couldn't handle any pressure, so it couldn't hold the magma to come out of the top. The magma just blew out the bottom and formed a vent right out the side. And here we have this flow, second flow of basalt. Same stuff, it just didn't get cooled down like the first stuff did. So it's kind of a neat story. But you kind of go, hmm, okay, what about the silicon? Well, here's a picture of Kilauea again. And you can see this basaltic lava coming out of Kilauea. And look how it's just flowing over this cliff. You can see the surface is a little, little chilled. You kind of see a crust forming. Notice how that magma, hot magma is just flowing under that crust and flowing along. This is what we call an effusive flow because it's just effusing all over the surface, just spilling out. So those are pretty cool. Now, this cone is what we would call a pyroclastic flow, broken fire. All right, fire for pyroclastic. Uh, broken. Uh, uh, broken. So
so whenever I see this stuff just kind of spinning out as little bits falling down around the, the, the cone and building a cone, it's going to be a pyroclastic type of eruption. When I see it just spreading out just in these big sheets all over the place and cooling in these layers, thin layers, that's an effusive kind of flow. And that's usually going to be a basaltic flow. So as viscosity goes up, I'm going to see effusive flows change into more explosive kind of flows. Because that means that the silica content is going up or the temperature is going down or both. The vent's getting plugged up. The pressure's building up. And finally, that plug gets blown out of the volcano, comes down as broken shards of stuff all over, and starts building a cone. So that would mean effusive flows are going to be basalt, because they have low viscosity. And they're going to flow all over the place as effusive flows. But as I start to add silica, in other words, I'm going down Bowen's reaction series, and I'm going from the mafic end of the classification scheme over to the felsic end, I'm going to start to see the style of volcanism change from these big giant flows to these big explosive volcanoes. And that also means the gas content's got to be increasing because it's going to take gas to push that plug out of the vent. If I don't have gas pressure down in the magma chamber to blow out that plug, what's going to happen to the volcano? It's just going to plug off, and that's the end of it, right? So I would expect that to occur if I have a lot of silica in the mix. It's just going to plug up the volcano. The pressure can't get high enough blow out that plug, and I've got those little cinder cone volcanoes, or what we call a rhyolite plug volcano. So different styles of volcanism depending on the composition and temperature of the material that's making up the, the volcano. OK, back to Kilauea. Here's our low viscosity basalt. And you can just see it moving along. It's spreading out. So where's it kind of cool the fastest? Right at the surface, isn't it? Right where it's exposed to the air. As I go deeper into the flow, that's going to be more and more insulated and protected by the overlying hot magma on top of it. So it's going to cool from the top down, isn't it? Kind of basic, don't you think? So what we're seeing is on top of this flow, and you can see it right here, but back here, you can kind of see it's cooling on the surface and it's getting just slightly, a little bit of a crust. Sort of like how pudding kind of cools off and you get that, that skin <coughs> on the top of the pudding. That same thing's happening here. But it's still flowing quite hot underneath. And as it does that, it drags the skin along a little bit and forms these wrinkles. And you can see it's flowing the fastest right along here, right along there. So you get this kind of bowed out area. Does that not sound like a small scale version of plate tectonics with mantle convection coming up pulling the crustal plates apart? That tractive force from down below? So here you've got this pattern forming on the surface. And if it cools like that, that's what you get. Kind of looks like a sailor went and coiled up a, a rope on the deck. They call this ropey texture. texture. And this is known as pohoi pohoi lava. It's a Hawaiian term. So this would be ropey pohoi pohoi lava. And you can see these guys here. This is obviously where some of that hot magma from down underneath kind of broke through the skin and blurped up on top and then cooled before it really moved anywhere. So it didn't develop that ropey pattern. Sort of like one of these blobs right here. So you see these things, and these are oftentimes called lava blisters or squeeze ups. Uh, sometimes they're called pressure ridges. That's a little confusing because this is usually what we refer to, these transverse ropey looking things. Those are usually the transverse.